everyone, and welcome finally to another exciting episode of Spider-Man Page by Page. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Dan, I'm so glad to have you back, man. It's good to be back. Uh, we finally got our schedules to align. We've been trying to get together and do another episode of this for a long time now. Uh, I bet everyone thought it was canceled. No, no, no. We don't cancel shows like this. The, these ideas are too good to be canceled. <laughs> Uh, today, it's been, it's been a really long time, and I know that I just posted another episode uh, a week ago, but that's actually one that Dan and I recorded months and months ago uh, that, for a couple of reasons, never actually got together. So um, you are hearing our lovely voices from at least nine months ago when you listen to that video. Uh, so for Dan and I, this is our first time back in a good long time, and today we are going to tackle The Amazing Spider-Man number four, which is the introduction to The Sandman, once again, written by Stan Lee with art by Steve Ditko. One point I kind of wanted to make right out the gate with this issue is that it's starting to feel like, even though there is a progression with Peter and uh, his finding his footing as a superhero, and we're being real gradual about that, uh, we've, we're starting to come into kind of a formula, I think, where, yeah. you, you know, J. Jonah Jameson hates him and is trying to ruin him, and he goes up against some new supervillain, and he uh, kind of d sort of maybe discovers something about himself in dealing with, with, with that with that villain and about his his new superhero lifestyle and especially about having a dual identity and then you get to the end and he thinks everything's hunky dory and then he discovers a consequence at the very end like that seems to be kind of what the formula is at the moment anyway that's definitely what the formula is for a little while um once steve ditko um becomes a little bit more um involved in plotting the stories i hesitate saying that because we don't know exactly like which stories he was involved with plotting almost everything but there was a point where Ditko was basically um, doing everything um, but putting the dialogue in and that's the usual Marvel method but Stanley was a little bit more collaborative on some of the earlier issues that we know of it's 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 kind of a sketchy thing, but once Steve Ditko really gets to um, you know kind of tell the stories that he wanted to, um, and Lee was writing the dialogue, it gets a little bit more continuity heavy and complex and less formulaic. But definitely for the early issues, where we're introducing all this stuff. There, you're right; it's definitely a bit formulaic for sure. I feel as though it may be safe to say, and again, we don't know for sure, uh, or if it's written down anywhere, it's either something I haven't read or something I've forgotten about. But I I, I feel like we're we, it's probably safe to say. That at least this early, uh, Stan Lee is 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 uh, more involved with the plotting than he was later. Because this does not feel to me like the exactly the way Steve Ditko would have plotted this this particular yeah. issue. Yeah, definitely. Stan Lee feels like he's got the reins more. Um, certainly in the choreography of the action scenes, that's all Ditko. Yeah, and I felt. It felt very Stan Lee-ish when we got the backstory of the Sandman, where it was just kind of it was just like just in case. Uh, people who haven't watched this news report before don't know the origin of the Sandman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this this really like this hilariously forced exposition. Yeah, yeah. Um, but before we uh, move on to any of the further pages here, I just yeah. want to mention Steve Ditko's um, title pages are always my favorite thing about the issues that he draws because they always indicate the theme of the story. And um, this is specific this story is specifically about like the public perception of these people with super with superpowers and um also of course dealing with the duality of peter parker's life so we got like the line down the middle there we've got like the kids that are kind of in awe in spider-man he's the good guy the police are angry at the sandman and he, he's kind of straddling the line um spider-man is hated and feared by the public and so is the Sandman, but Sandman's kind of the guy that deserves to be hated and feared because he's got all this power and he's misusing it, whereas Spider-Man's being treated the same way even though he's trying to do good things. Like, we, we see him, like, early on try to, you know, um, you have trouble, like, with the legal system and how, like, he's trying to keep preemptively catch robbers and stuff, which for which I, I think for a superhero comic is something that a lot of them never really even thought about, which is interesting, um, that we'll get into as we as we move along. But I, I just wanted to mention before we really got into it that, as always, Steve Ditko does a good job of sort of laying out what kind of story we're going to get here. Um, he's, he's always really good at that stuff. Yeah, I think it's important to mention that Sandman in this is very much, at least to me, what Spider-Man was a couple issues back kind of afraid that he was destined to turn into. 
yeah, just a man that's mad with power and, um, uh, you know, stealing stealing from other people be, because might makes right, you know? That's yeah, right. and because he worries that if the whole world is going to turn against him, but he has these powers and he can't, can't help but use them because of this sense of responsibility he has, maybe he's just... His only recourse is to be this hated and feared villain no matter what he does, so you might as well embrace it. Uh, that's a thing he talks about, I think, in the first or second issue. And uh, it's and, and, and so now uh, with Sandman, we've got a guy that um, has embraced that where, where he was... And importantly, he was already like this before he got the sand powers, so he is... Um, so he is already... So, like, he never got the responsibility message. Obviously, and uh, so there's there's a clear um, like like even though the Sandman is not a really interesting, fully developed three dimensional character, um, not even in the slightest, not way. not remotely. <laughs> uh, there's uh, there's there's quite a bit of paralleling um, between uh, uh, him and uh, Spider Man just as ideas, and uh, I kind of feel like, uh, especially just with that title page, that um, the idea more from Ditko than from Lee probably. I mean. I I see this more on the page than I'm reading it in the uh, you know in the narrative. Uh, you've you've got kind of this notion, if I'm not reading too far into it, that um, that you you have this kind of like lack of substance with Sandman, where he can be anything, but he's actually kind of nothing. And so the fact that he is a uh, kind of a kind of nothing character uh, is almost hilariously built into him and is almost intentional in a way that it hasn't been with our villains up till this because nobody's really been fully drawn and super interesting yet. Um, and uh, I mean, Doc Ock more than anybody, but that's not saying a lot yet. Yeah, I, I think you, I think you're onto some there. Like the Sandman is very clearly just kind of a loser um, mm -hmm. as an individual person, and I, I think. I think his powers Maybe, are meant to reflect that in a way. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, like, everyone in this issue is is suspicious of people with power, so it makes people with power, even if they, they have good intentions, um, it makes them difficult to exercise that power in order to help other people um, because of the way people perceive people, like, people who have this kind of power. So, like, Spider-Man's, like, like you said, maybe he is destined to become... Um, like maybe if, if society says this is what people with power are, um, are individuals able to rise above that is the question. And I think Spider-Man is proof positive that individuals can triumph over that, um, you know, perception. Of, but again, he's of, gradually working at exactly, that, and it's difficult exactly, for him, yeah. which is why you yeah. root for him. Um, and that's a really relatable idea uh, that I think we all face in our everyday lives. And again, Spider-Man is supposed to be the the everyman comic in a in a in a period of time with superhero comics where we didn't have that. Where I uh, where Dan, if people are constantly telling you that you are a thing, it's very difficult to be what you want to be versus that. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, I also want to mention that this title page. Uh, I, I think there is visually, and I and I love what you what, what you uh, what you gleaned from this title page. Uh, that there is as much or more going on on this title page than there is uh, thematically and idea wise in the entire comic book. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there, a pretty but straightforward and simple story. It is, sure. but there's some stuff, and we'll get to it. Uh, one thing I, I I should say is that uh, this is one. You know, we're finally starting to get to get out of the uh, the the blatantly labeled three act stories and then the uh, two stories in the same issue uh, that are sharing the real estate. This is one that easily could have been uh, uh, dropped down to 15 pages in, in in favor of putting another one next to it. I think. Yeah, I think so too. Um, but I think it does benefit from having some of the internal monologue that Spider-Man would become famous for, and some of the scenes of him just you know dating people and stuff. Like this could have definitely just been an action-driven, com a completely action-driven story. I mean, all of all superhero stories are to some degree action-driven, um, but but I think uh, the increased panel um, time. I don't know, even know if that's the right word for that. But like, give, dedicating more panel space to some of the more personal stuff, I think was beneficial. Well, that's a good point because, story. yeah, because even if this was really short, it would probably have the same amount of action as it has because that exactly. would have, that would have been even for Stan Lee trying to do these kinds of stories, that would have still been uh, a a, a, a uh, you know important thing to put up front to sell copies. So, oh yeah, definitely. 
you know, it would have been hard not to prioritize that. At the beginning, we've got uh, Spider-Man, and I think this is one of the most interesting things in the whole story, um, Spider-Man trying to preempt crime, where he is trying to stop these, um, what, what, Jewel Thieves, I think, and um, they haven't broken into the store yet, but he can tell that they're definitely going to. And um, at first I thought this might have been a little bit more interesting if he was actually um, making assumptions about people, and then it turned out they weren't really trying to rob the place. But then you get to the end of the scene, and you've got uh, the cop saying, um, you, you know, honestly, if I was Spider-Man, I would have had a hard time grabbing these guys also. They clearly, I mean, just look at these guys' faces, Dan, on the second page here. Uh, like, 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 I, uh, I, uh, thugs were so often written with these big, drawn with these big, goofy smiles on their faces during this yeah, period. Yeah, they're, cl they're classic Silver Age Marvel thugs. Uh, Steve Ditko will draw people that look like this all over his issues of Spider-Man. It's awesome. They look like they should be in the Disney version of Pinocchio. Like they look like they should. <laughs> the, these are guys that should be hanging out on uh, that isle. That island. Where, they reminded me of like marionette puppets too, which I yeah. guess is like Pinocchio. It's like yeah. Pinocchio. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, so Spider-Man is uh, he, he screws up there, and he's lamenting um, how he's uh, kind of messing up a lot in his uh, you know beginnings of, of trying to be a superhero and how um, J. Jonah Jameson hates him and has turned the whole city against him, but he keeps making mistakes like this that are kind of uh, uh, exacerbating that problem. Yeah, and it doesn't really, like, explore the idea thoroughly, but I think, like, the... like the ability of cops to like combat crime and whether or not we should preempt crime is always a question that is um, something we deal with in law enforcement. I mean, we've dealt with that idea in all sorts of different types of fiction. Um, it, it's just briefly brought up here, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah, sort and of I think a more put in this seasoned, context, you know? Yeah, and I think a more seasoned Spider-Man um, would have dropped down and uh, not fought them and not attempted to rope them up or arrest them or anything and just say, look, I can tell what you guys are about to do. You probably ought to run off. Uh, and if he had done that, he wouldn't have had the same problem he has here. That's right. Um, he would have done the thing, uh, possibly, that he does at the in the uh, intro to the 67 animated cartoon where he arrives just in time. and kicks <laughs> the kicks open the He arrives just in time. Yeah. <laughs> Because that, that's literally what happens in that animated intro. It's dual thieves breaking into a place. And so speaking good. of arriving just in time, uh, so he's swinging around some more, and then he runs into uh, another thug, and uh, I guess I, I guess he is um, kind of uh, sort of learned his the lesson that he just learned, and uh, he shines his spider light, and he says just to let him know what he's up against. Uh, what do you make of that, Dan? Why does Spider-Man shine a light to let the criminals know what's coming i always sort of thought that the spider signal was like a method of intimidation sort of like you know a, a thug sees the spider signal it's like oh crap like i committed a crime about, about to be busted like i it is kind of a funny idea to to think that uh it's a it's a way to prepare the thugs for their imminent doom you know? he acts here like it's a common courtesy yeah yeah um I wanted to mention something as we introduce Sandman on this page here, um, because I just think it's a really funny anecdote about Spider-Man history and like the way that the character is drawn. Um, so we have the famous Steve Ditko evil man haircut here, um, <laughs> which is like weird cornrows, uh, which are inherited also by the Osborne family. That's and right. They're just more orangish usually. They uh, they actually yeah you're right. They they do look almost exactly like his haircut though and. Funnily enough, if you read Spider-Man Chapter 1, when they tried to reboot uh, Spider-Man after the Clone Saga, they gave it to John Byrne to like retell his origin and stuff. And they make Sandman and the Osborns related because they have the same haircut. It's it's kind of awesome. <laughs> that That is awesome. I love that. Uh, that's what Spider-Man Homecoming should do. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> so this is Spider-Man's first real superpowered villain, I think. Yes, that's right. The other ones have been technology so far. Mm -hmm. and, well, if you want to call uh, the chameleon technology, he just kind of walks around with some masks and puts them on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's very good at making masks. That's <laughs> it's right. technologically advanced. We don't even have masks that good today. No. Come on, don't. future. You're disappointing us. He's got false face masks right before false face. That's true. That's true. 
And so uh, he's he's really kind of surprised, of course, because uh, he's he's going up against the first person who can kind of uh, super powered in a super powered way go up against him, and that is is kind of. Uh, uh, too much of a match for him and uh, you know Doc Ock was kind of too much for him but this is a, a different level in a way how do you fight a guy that you can't even punch yeah and the the thing about Sandman is like he's not even a character that like very many superheroes would be able to fight uh, like Spider-Man's only able to beat him at the end of the day because he's a smart person which kind yeah. of speak, speaks to the theme of the story we were talking about earlier like he's a competent individual whereas Sandman's kind of a loser even though he has this power that's so great like he's never able to rise above the rank of petty bank thief uh, like like that's what he thinks to do with his power rather than trying to help other people um, like I, I've heard people sort of complain about Sandman, like that he doesn't he doesn't really fit into the Spider-Man Rogues Gallery as as well as some of the other ones because he doesn't really fit Spider-Man's power set. And because he's not an animal. That that's very true. I mean, there are there are animals that live in sand. That's but... true. He could be like <laughs> scorpion sand guy. He could have like a scorpion head. That's true. Yeah. Oh, they should do that. They should have done that. He could be related to the Osborns and have a scorpion head to uh, <laughs> to hide his cornrows. I am the sand scorp. Fear me. Cuckoo cuckoo. Anyway, um. but uh, but but yeah, I I've always kind of enjoyed the Sandman um, as a character that's kind of a like exactly as he as he is here. He's a sad sack loser, and because he's such a he's such a kind of terrible. Not even terrible in the in the way that like Norman Osborn is is terrible. Like he's evil. Flint Marco is just kind of kind of a loser, and mm -hmm. like con contrasting him with Peter Parker, I think has always been an interesting con uh, contrast because, yeah, his like Flint Marco's raw power versus Peter Parker's raw power. If you gave them to equivalent individuals, like Sandman would win every time because Peter Parker is who he is. That's why he's able to beat him, and yeah. I, I I think that's how he's useful in Spider Man stories, and that's why I've always kind of liked him. Yeah, and it's because I mean raw intelligence plays a part, but it's also because uh, he's the, the for for Peter obviously the stakes are higher because he cares about people. I think it's important that that fight takes place in the school, right. yes, and and things like that. Uh, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Uh, one thing I'm wondering on this page uh, with, with their with their first fight is uh, how exactly Spider Man's mask gets ripped to the point of being in two pieces on the front of his of his head. I just I don't even know what happened there. Like it gets hit in the midsection and then he hits his head and now it, it's it, like if if it was a mask that could crack i could almost see it but it's 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 sewn like how does that work that's true i wasn't thinking about that it really doesn't really make all that much sense that it ripped there does it that's no. that's weird i just think that's kind of funny i do like here that we uh we we see the the famous spider-man floating heads yes uh, which is one of my favorite things that is a consistent uh, thing throughout all Silver Age and some Bronze Age Spider-Man, just floating heads talking to Peter Parker as he thinks about people. One of the, one of the reasons I like it, like, and you know, we were talking earlier about how this is kind of continuing and, and helping to establish the formula, but I think it's also, uh, th this is a major setup issue for a lot of the, uh, of the motifs, not just themes, but motifs in Spider-Man. Obviously, uh, this has the first girl he attempts to date uh, but yes. also the floating heads are important because that's Peter Parker that's us getting into his head and that's where he most feels like or, or sometimes some of what makes him most feel to me like a real uh, teenager that looks at the world the way a, the way a kid would where he kind of overblows things and um, he has this like overactive imagination and um, this is probably my favorite panel in the issue uh, you, you, he's like really exaggerated in his mind what would happen to him if, if he was found out as Spider-Man and like, like, and like maybe some of this is sort of what would happen but like it's played as a nightmare and I really like that I like it a lot too and I, I like it for all those reasons, but I also love it as well because Aunt May is selling shoelaces, and that's hysterical. Well, that's one of the that's one of the things <laughs> that I was going to mention and that I really like about it because um, it, that that's where a little bit of the absurdity of that comes in, where like he's looking at this as a kid, like like if I get found out, my aunt is going to be on the street selling shoelaces. 
Yeah, it's really funny. And I guess we can talk about it a little bit more when we get to it. But not only does this issue um, introduce Peter finally, like, trying to date girls and stuff, it also um, introduces the first girl he will have a major relationship with. This is the first uh, appearance of Betty Brant, which is kind of cool. Oh, I Um, forgot about that. yeah. Yeah. And she does notice him when he walks in um, and says, oh, that's, that's J. Jonah Jameson's young photographer. She doesn't say she's attracted to him yet, but she will – I love Betty Brandt. She's um, – in her early appearances, she's a little bit less likable than she becomes later on. Like the, the way, the way that um, Peter – her and Peter's relationship uh, plays out here, it's a little bit more melodramatic than some of the other relationships we'll see later on. Um, but, but I do like Betty a lot as a character. She's great. Uh, Dan, I, I also think that it's more likely that Aunt May would try to open a wheat cake restaurant Yes, than to sell shoelaces. See, I don't know why we don't call them wheat cakes anymore. I, I don't either, but ever since we, we the wheat cake panel, I, I all I want to do is call them wheat cakes. Oh my god. We need to open a comic book themed breakfast restaurant and serve wheat cakes. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah a, comic, a comic slash breakfast place. That would be awesome. Like we everything on the menu in the lobby, is... and that yeah, and you have wheat cakes. Uh, we could call them Aunt May's wheat cakes. Uh, <laughs> the best. Oh my god, that's that's brilliant. Yeah, uh, no one else can have that. That's mine and Dan's <laughs> patented geek solution. Uh, so he, this guy is just a bank robber. That's what he's here to do. Uh, I we we start to get even for Stan Lee a little bit overwritten here. I don't think yes. we need all of this internal monologue about how uh, uh, oh boy, look, my powers are even better than having tools. It's like yeah, we get it. We can see what you're doing. We don't really we don't really <laughs> need all that. So so he's four panels devoted to and he broke into a bank with his powers. Take all that dialogue off. You don't need any of it. And um, then we've got Peter Parker attempting to sew his uh, mask and again lamenting. He does a lot of lamenting in this issue. He is he, he is not happy about having to sew things and if only he could tell his aunt his secret identity, he would not have to learn how to sew. And we have the little recap of the Sandman origin here which is like it's so hard straight, not to laugh at. Yeah, and it's straight out of um, Spider-Man 3. Like I I kind of forgot how faithful Raimi was to this first appearance uh, when he was doing the Sandman origin in the movie. Not that anyone would have cared if he was, but he was. I care. I like Sandman. <laughs> I, well, I like that movie, but I like Sandman. Again, I think that uh, these are all characters that get a little bit more character dimension later. Uh, yes. Like, yes. I don't I don't think... Yeah, like, his his origin here is, as Stanley often makes it, you know, just uh, some kind of an excuse to give him the power set that he has. Um, of course, I always appreciate that more than spending a whole story doing that that's not really a story. Uh, so, like, I'm not gonna begrudge him that, but, um, I don't know. Something about this origin is kind of funny. We, we don't even know what he went to jail for. He's just a bad dude. And he gets out yeah. of jail, and he uh, hides in a nuclear test site. And of course, it's the '60s, and it's in in the height of the Cold War, so it's the it's a nuclear test site. And um, we we are, uh, and um, you know, nukes make everything uh, make all the bad guys, Dan. Bad well, guys. yeah, that, that's the funny thing about it. It's basically Bruce Banner's origin, but with sand. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. But with sand. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and no Rick Jones that, like, Bruce Banner is trying to be noble and save and stuff. But, like... It's, no, he it's just hides cool. there because he doesn't think anybody else will be stupid enough to go there, and he's right. I love that. Like, like as close as he gets to... The closest that, that uh, Flint Marco gets to being clever is doing dumb things that no one else is dumb enough to do. Yeah, and I think the real question here needs to be, like... When Bruce Banner had the Gamma Bomb go off... Was there sand around him? Why is he not a sand man? Was the <laughs> why is he why is the Hulk not grass man? If there was grass where the nuke was put off, I these are the hard hitting questions we need the answers to. Yeah, why didn't the Fantastic Four all turn into space? <laughs> <laughs> they just turned into space. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say stars, but then like I don't know that that makes any sense. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Um, so this has become something of a classic thing with Spider-Man things, or classic, I guess just a thing that we see a lot. Like, like this has shown up in at least two of different incarnations on, on uh, li- in live-action movies where, uh, where Peter has his outfit on and Aunt May tries to come in, so he puts a robe on over it. Uh, we, we seem to do that all the time. 
Yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely something they did in the Raimi movies and uh, in Amazing as well. Um, I, I assume we'll probably get it in whatever um, Marvel ends up doing with the character. I, it's kind of a classic thing. I just can't, I can't get over how much Rosemary Harris looks like Aunt May from the comics. They are like exactly the same person. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, the the funny thing about Aunt May, I, I I feel like we've probably mentioned this before, it, but she's just like perpetually ninety years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she yeah, yeah she doesn't age, but like Peter she just, does. She just stays. <laughs> yeah, she just she just stays at that age forever. Um, I also think something important to mention about Aunt May is that um she is characterized, and again, she's not much more of a character than any of the villains are yet, yeah. uh, but she is she is characterized as being um, kind of naive and uh, kind of easily manipulated, like, like, like she's, she's um, you know, she kind of buys into whatever the popular media tells her. Yes. Um, she's kind of a victim of, uh, you know, Jameson's, and she's very similar to a lot of the other uh, people we see at the end of the issue talking about Spider-Man on the streets and stuff. Um, and that's something that we played with in some of the, in the other adaptations as well. Um, not as like directly as you know, Aunt May just reading the paper and relaying and just parroting what J. Jonah Jameson says, but her sort of just viewing Spider-Man in a negative light because she believes that you know it's the job of the police to do that job. That's why I kind of appreciated that by Spider-Man Two, uh, she she makes it kind of clear that maybe she knows. That's one of the things that we do later on with Aunt May too. Um, that this kind of uh, uh, naivety that she has in the early issues is kind of a put on uh, because she. I mean. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that that she's doing it for Peter's benefit, and um, she doesn't want him to worry ab about like uh, you know her worrying about him and like being in danger and stuff, uh, things like that. Um, like, sort of like the the um, you know the Jim Gordon thing, like oh, does he know that Bruce Wayne is Batman the whole time? That's sort of, that's sort of dynamic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So now uh, the cops are after Marco. I, I appreciate that the cops don't seem totally incompetent in this, although I have to mention that uh, it, it is it is kind of funny that uh, we've got this narration box that says, uh, the unsuspecting officers run fast for who would think to suspect what lies beneath an innocent-looking mound of sand in a vacant lot? I mean, well... I don't know why there'd be a big mound of sand in a vacant <laughs> lot, and you know that there's this guy that has sand powers running. Around. It's not a secret that he has sand because, like, because like when Spider-Man first meets him, he's he's like, "I heard about you. I thought you might be like a legend." So people have heard about this guy with sand powers. I don't know. That looks suspicious to me, Dan. It's weird. Well, to yeah, they and just they, run they, past it. And they showed him being all sandy on the news report that we were. Oh, doing. so like everybody knows for sure now. Yes, exactly. Um... So yeah, these are terrible <laughs> police officers. Shame yeah, on them. Yeah. Okay. So I said it's good they're not entirely. Co the comic doesn't think they're incompetent. They're they're clearly incompetent. <laughs> I like that the narration box is basically telling you it's either being facetious about it or it's saying no kids. These cops are really good at their jobs. I'm not sure which it's doing. I think Jameson's ranting about the wrong people in his newspapers. <laughs> that's that's clearly that's clearly accurate there. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I like the touch of Aunt May constantly making Peter carry an umbrella, and I like that he, he talks about kind of the irony of that, and that it's it's kind of weird that, you know, I'm a superhero, and my aunt makes me carry an umbrella, and I like that how that pays off later, where people are making fun of him for having an umbrella. Yeah, and that's one of the things I've always loved about Peter Parker as a character, where, like, I think a lot of teenage characters, like Johnny Storm, for example, like, if, if his doting aunt asked him to carry an umbrella, he'd be like, no, like, that's not cool. I'm not going to carry an umbrella. And Peter Parker, like he, he obliges his aunt because he cares about her and wants to make her happy. So you know he carries it. He carries it because you know his aunt worries about him and he wants to make her feel good. And even though the kids make fun of him, he's like, I don't care about these people. These people are dumb. So you mentioned, so you mentioned the first appearance of uh, Betty Brant. There it is. Yep, uh, she does nothing but notice that Peter Parker exists in this initial appearance, uh, but she will become a major character. Uh, I want to really watch for this, Dan. If I was counting things in Spider-Man comics, this would be a thing I would be counting, which is, uh, do we ever see 
J. Jonah Jameson again without pants. Uh, I think it's I think that's <laughs> really amusing. Uh, Spider Man comes in and I, I I think this is so funny that he's still like very gradually maturing. He does these immature things where like just after he uh, thinks about the uh, the 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 like the like morality of trying to stop people before he's sure that they really did a thing, and also just how not smart that was. He then immediately, a page later, breaks and enters and puts spider web <laughs> on J. Jonah Jameson's chair, and and here he shows up. J. Jonah Jameson. I mean, this is just a typical like eighth grade prank that <laughs> Spider Man has done, just because he's annoyed at this guy for turning the city. Against against him he's like that's his comeuppance he's like you, you know if and, and, and i love this because this guy who is becoming a real bona fide hero and if he was going in more of the super villain direction because remember early on he sounded dangerous the only person i care about is aunt may everyone else can go hang for all i care yeah. we're now at a place where he has evolved uh, uh, intellectually or e e evolved um uh, you know you know emotionally to the point where instead of Physical revenge, spider web on a chair. <laughs> and he Peter Parker walks in and he goes, Oh yeah, I totally forgot I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so he's then he's just nonchalantly like like putting his pants on, not even saying anything about it to Peter Parker. Uh Peter walks in and he's like, Oh, uh somebody told me to bring you some pants. <laughs> and he's like, You got any pictures of my he's like, Nope, but I got pants. <laughs> yeah, this this scene makes me laugh out loud every time I read it. Uh, uh, J. Joan Jameson's perfect. Such a wonderful <laughs> character. Another stagnant character that we love for his stagnation. Oh yeah, exactly. J. Jonah Jameson is like the Batman of the Marvel Universe. He's never going to change, but he but we love him for it. You know. Okay, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so he's like, he's like, uh, bring me some pictures. That's gonna pay off a little bit later uh, in another really amusing way. Yeah. And uh, now we get into uh, Peter deciding, okay, I've got to spend my evening going to find the salmon. I guess it's because he thinks that he's the only person that can solve this problem, even though he hasn't figured out how he's gonna actually deal with it yet because he can't punch through the guy like like i'm not sure why he's seeing this as his responsibility over the cops right now yeah i, I would imagine it's because he feels like he's the only one that has the power to stop him even though That's he doesn't he... know how he's going to do that yet it really comes off like well he's the superhero of the story so of course he's chasing the guy and at the and, and like and like i'll i'll meet stan lee this far he's at least gotten him to a place where he is trying to be a hero instead of making everything about him now and we have right. believably gotten him to that place so i'll buy it for that i guess yeah and yeah i i i took that um you know what Stanley was was going there, uh, like you were talking about, and I think it kind of fits in with the theme of the story. Like even even if it's not necessarily like ex explained explicitly, mm -hmm. um, which maybe maybe it should have been. I, I think thematically it works. Like you know, Peter Parker is saying, you know, I ha I have the uh, the power to stop another guy that's even more powerful that's misusing his power, and it's my obligation to do something about it. So he was supposed to have a date with Liz Allen. I think this is really interesting. Uh, he just bothers her and bothers her about about going out with him and she finally just says okay fine whatever yeah <laughs> and then he is of of course he's got Murphy's law and this is this is that very classic and this is the beginning of that very classic Spider-Man thing where something always comes up when he's supposed to go out with a girl and she can't understand him because he can't tell her who he is and uh it's that you know trying to balance your personal life with being a superhero thing this is where all that starts and uh he's got to go chase after the Sandman so he can't go out with her with her now and uh now uh uh, uh, Flash Thompson is making his moves again. Oh yeah, ladies' man, Flash Thompson, with that big orange hair and that wonderful sweater. Look at that thing. Like I, I, I love how you know, you know, you you look, you look back at the '60s and you go, wait, who looks more nerdy in this scene to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I love that Peter Parker is the nerd in that scene. I know, right? I um. He's got an umbrella. What a goof. 
I know, right? <laughs> I'm really um, excited to see what they do with Liz Allen um, in because it's kind of been leaked and confirmed that Liz Allen's going to be in the new Spider-Man uh, movie coming up here. Yeah. And um, she, of course, in the comics, eventually marries uh, Harry Osborn and has a son with him. So I'm hoping that uh, she's sort of the way in which we introduce the Osborns into uh, the equation at some point in the movie. That would be kind of cool. I think it's unlikely that she'll be uh, the, the main love interest for Peter in that movie. Yeah, I doubt it. Um, I mean, she, in Spectacular Spider-Man, they... they um, sort of try to have a relationship at one point so I can see them like like in, in this like them maybe having a possibility of having a fling for you know a short amount of time and then it doesn't work out or something like that heck I could even see introducing her breaking up with him yeah that would be kind of cool too yeah that'd be a thing to do yeah, yeah. oh forget you Peter Parker you're never here when I need you and that's how you introduce her yeah oh that yeah. would be awesome yeah uh, so now we've got Flint Marco turning into a worm thing he's a snake He's a snake, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the the uh, the imagery there is clear, and he, <laughs> and he's using his sand powers to get away from the cops, uh, but he's finding it difficult. Uh, so like, so like, uh, you know, the cops apparently aren't aren't are still supposed to not be as incompetent as we think they are. Um, and then uh, I would just like to point out before we move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I was gonna mention that... something too. Go ahead. That the language using his sand powers to escape from the cops is such a funny phrase without the visuals. Like, imagine just saying that to someone like, oh, yeah, I use sand powers to get away. I use sand powers. <laughs> uh, I, I also think it's important to note that Steve Ditko is constantly uh, setting up stuff visually that, uh, that... that Stan Lee may or may not have asked him to do or been a part of. Uh, mm -hmm. This vacuum cleaner is later the way that Spider-Man beats Sandman. That's right, yeah. And it's it's being uh, introduced this early, and it's and and, and that, that's that's a cool continuity thing because Peter notices it, and so you can see the wheels turning um, later on. Where it's like, oh yeah, that that, that vacuum cleaner, um, and it's it's a it's a small detail, uh, but it makes it it makes him feel more like a real thinking person. That's right, and, and I'm if glad he just that... went, oh look, like like, and it also feels less like it's a plant when we get there. I was gonna say that. Um, it, I think Stan Lee, in his um, infinite uh, wisdom of overwriting scenes, could have easily taken that uh, that vacuum cleaner thing and been like, I wonder if I can use this to fight the Sandman later on and stuff like that. Um, but it, yeah, it's better. It's very subtly done, and I like that about it a lot. He goes all Luigi's Mansion. On, uh, on Mark. That's awesome. I, I want to see if at some point he goes on Mario Sunshine and <laughs> puts a backpack on his back and sprays water and everything. Mario! Uh, I like this little bit where the kids are all impressed with the principal for standing up to the Sandman and saying, No! You get no diploma! <laughs> yeah. I think it's a very on-the-nose message that, like, as an individual, you need to, like, earn your way in the world to become a better person. It's it's point. very obvious uh, trying to, you know, have a moment where the theme of the story is spelled out. They'll stay, do that less stay later in, on. Stay in school, kids. Yeah, yeah, that's true as you well. You get a lot of 60s Batman episodes that are doing that on purpose and are kind of making fun of things like this, I think. That's true. <laughs> uh, it, it's reminiscent of, like, the, the G.I. Joe and... Uh, TM and TPSAs um, from back in the '80s and stuff, um, but I I love the way that Steve Ditko draws Sandman in these scenes because he just looks like an absolute buffoon. Yeah. But also because um, I love all the cross hashing on the face and stuff, so it looks like he's almost made out of sand, even though he's a solid thing there. That's it, a good point. It looks really cool. Yeah, uh, and then Spider Man is just in in these action scenes is incredibly dynamic. I really like. Oh what he yeah. Looks like. Uh, and we, we should mention how uh, convenient it is that uh, Flint Marco winds up at Peter Parker's school, and that he just happens to be walking down that hallway when he is. I uh, like, 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 uh, like Sandman turns around and goes, "I gotta hide someplace." Oh, what a school! <laughs> yeah, it is rather convenient. You're right. Uh, so, so Spider-Man is uh, fl fighting Flint Marco in front of the people that have most given him guff as Peter Parker. I think that's important. Um, I think that the the the, the Peter Parker uh, before he matured as much as he has and learned some of the lessons he's learned uh, might have just walked away. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, 
because and, and this is a little bit even more intimately connected to him than some of the other problems he's had where it's like this is his his school, the place where he's getting his education, where he hopes to graduate and go to college and stuff, where he, you know he's he's got some sort of investment in his place as opposed yeah. to some of the other uh, problems he's dealt with. So, um, yeah, yeah, I know, I agree with you. And um, he's doing this somewhat snidely, you know. He's saying here, if uh, if these people knew that I was Peter Parker, would they be cheering me like they are? You know, I mean, he's 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 feeling vindictive, but he's not acting on that. He's doing the right thing while thinking a little bit more selfishly. And this is the reverse of the situation he usually experiences, where, like, Spider-Man is the one that um, everyone hates, whereas, like, generally, like, you know, the, the kids at school don't treat Peter well because he's a nerd and, he, you know, he's smarter than everyone else and stuff, but, like, generally, like, people seem to think Peter Parker's a, a good kid and stuff, you know? Um, so it's, it, it's interesting to see the roles reversed. Uh, I, I want to mention before we move on, too, like, in the bottom right panel there, some of the children in that shot have scary facial expressions. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh... <laughs> I, I think Ditko must have read some Archie right before he went to Yes, bed. I was reminded of Archie specifically with the kid with the black hair poking yes. up the side there. Yep. Yeah, he that guy looks, That guy is going to go get a hot dog right after this. Um, looks like he's out of a Twilight Zone episode or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now we've got a big fight, and Spider-Man's trying to figure out how he's going to beat uh, Sandman, and he has not yet come up with... His uh, rules. That's right. Um, yeah, it's it's so awesome. Like that, a lot of these Spider-Man, like specifically, like the visual elements of the of Sandman here, like are already established, like the hammer hand and stuff. Like Ditko, um, it, it, it's so um, it's so crazy that some people like don't acknowledge just sometimes out of ignorance because you know stanley is such a public face to marvel like people don't know that that steve duco was in, as involved in these characters as he was but like man you can't you can't understate his contribution it really is true that everyone like following ditko was kind of trying to be him i mean ramita had a different style but he was definitely like i mean some of the d designs ditko came up with are incredible yeah absolutely um and uh, we're, we're still fighting. I love the perspective with the hand there. Oh, yeah, it's great. That's really cool. And then uh, we get a surprisingly uh, kind of terrifying bit here where Spider-Man uh, uh, punches his hand straight through him, and then he solidifies it. He gets his hand, his arm stuck. And how, how lucky is he that somehow or rather uh, physics aren't working as such where the other side of his arm just gets lobbed off? Like, that's what I would yeah. think would happen. And this is a moment we do in uh, Spider-Man 3 when he drops into the uh, the back of the truck that Sandman's in. The, this exact thing happens. Uh, where does, he does he solidify his arm like that where he gets stung? I think he tries to pull out. I remember out him going through it, him. but I don't remember him getting stung. I, I I haven't watched that movie in a while, so I might be wrong. But it, it's it's similar to this. Um, I, I he might not get solidified and stuck in there, but um, yes, I think that's what they were going for. Um, you know, homaging this little moment here because Raimi obviously was looking at this uh, this issue to get the rousing origin of the Sandman <laughs> the screen. I was, I was, rousing. <laughs> Um, it, mu it must just be a bird. Hey, why don't we go check and make sure it's a bird before we try this nighttime ex experiment? Um, and, th and then the the guy from Iron Man Two is like, "Where is my bird? Where and is my bird? We have everything figured out." Yeah, you know what that guy's name is? Whiplash. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I like that we go so far as to have Spider Man just slam his head and it explodes in sand. Yes. Because he knows that he's like, like I like that that Peter Parker has been able to establish earlier that this guy is definitely uh, not going to be faced to that for, by that. So he knows that he won't actually kill him. Like, like we're we're being really thoughtful about what the rules are. Mm. You know what I would really like? I would really like a bear rug that looks like. Flint Marco in that top right panel. I, I can't. I couldn't handle that. <laughs> I don't think I could deal with that. Um, so, so now, so now Peter is getting really creative and uh, using some ingenuity. Uh, get, getting him to like. I like that it's not just one token 
smart idea that gets him beat. Like, he gets him to roll into a ball, and then he picks up a uh, drill and makes him think that he is that, that he somehow rather uh, uh, actually thinks that's going to do something to him. And of course, Marco hasn't picked up on how much smarter Spider-Man is than him, so he's like, "You idiot! That's not going to do anything." <laughs> and then he's like, "Yeah, that's why I'm going to use this uh, this vacuum cleaner, you idiot!" And a Sandman abhors a vacuum. Yeah, and it's it's funny that it's such an everyday item that he uses to to uh, defeat him too. It's classic Spider Man, right? Like Reed Richards would have built like some like molecular reorganizing gun or something that he would have spent ten the million dollars fixing <laughs> yeah. this problem. Yeah. And yeah. Spider Man did it with a, with a thirty nine ninety five shop vac that he found in the school building. That's actually the vacuuminator first appearance. Uh, in Spider-Man, is that is that what it is? Became, it, it, and and Eric got stuck in there along with the Sandman. <laughs> That's right. I, I I apologize for the inside jokes for anybody that doesn't regularly watch Geekvolution <laughs> for the last seven years. Uh, and then my probably my favorite bit, uh, my favorite comedic bit of the whole comic, where Spider-Man goes, "Oh wait, I didn't get any pictures." I know, I'll just throw some sand up in the air <laughs> and take... That's that's great. And I love that he goes so far as to say, since this really happened a few minutes ago, it can't be unethical! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all that stuff we said about Peter Parker maturing earlier. I love that he justifies that to himself. But again, it is gradual, and I think Stan Lee's doing, yeah. doing a great job of striking a balance between making him still feel like a teenage kid that hasn't grown up yet and not entirely unsympathetic and lacking in empathy. Right. Because he does hard. It, it is. We, and we, we did establish even earlier in this issue that like, if Peter Parker doesn't get his bills, Aunt May's going to be selling shoelaces on the side of the road. So, I mean, <laughs> he's got to get his money somehow. Right. Yes, that's right. And then, uh, and then we've got Jameson going, I want to talk to this guy. And, and so then we, no, that's not going to happen. And we have Spider-Man in front of the American flag. Also, straight out of Spider-Man 3. They probably weren't homaging this panel specifically, though. I thought Spider-Man 1 did the Spider-Man in front of the flag. Did we do that a couple times? He definitely No, definitely Spider-Man did. 1 had him had him swinging around one. That's what it was. Yeah, he definitely, like, lands in front of the American flag in Spider-Man 3. Uh, and then you kind of have... You kind of have this bit where uh, Spider-Man has the, and again, I think he's kind of been doing this where we get to the end and he's like, and he's like, okay, surely everybody's going to like me now. Nope. You know, and then it doesn't work out that way. And he's still kind of, uh, kind of having these like day nightmare, these daymares about uh, what would happen to him. And, uh, and, and, and this time it's not like, it's not like exaggerated and funny. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, scary image. It is. I, I wish that um, Spider-Man later on will do a lot of thought bubbling, and he's doing it here too. But I, I kind of wish we kept the, with this tradition of doing the kind of nightmare images all the time because they're kind of cool. Like we, we, we'll still see them every now and again. But like Spider-Man's kind of famous for like his, uh, you know, scenes where he's just swinging over the city because it looks cool, and he's got top balloons going all over the place. You know what I'm talking about? Like Tom McFarlane does that stuff all the time in his run on Spider-Man. You know? Uh, um, yeah. That's what sold a million copies. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, what what I like about it with Spider-Man stuff uh, often, and of course this might not always be the case, but but it, 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 so much when you get that kind of thing in dream sequences and stuff, uh, it's just kind of a gimmick and a, a sensational way to get a rise out of your audience. And it, it really does reveal something with this character much yeah. of the time. And we don't spend, like, pages doing it either. It'll be, like, a panel. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, and then... J. Jonah Jameson's taking the pictures. I love how oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. J. J. Jonah Jameson's funny here because he doesn't even question like what pictures Peter took. He's like, I have pictures, and but I didn't get them developed. And J. Jonah Jameson like trusts him at his word and just pays him without the film developing costs included. <laughs> I guess because he's I guess because he's desperate or because he doesn't actually have any journalistic integrity. Uh, Probably both. And what's great about that is that, so we talked about how, uh, I, I gotta mention this, about how at the beginning we didn't have the Daily Bugle yet and we just had Now Magazine and now we've decided that we want him to be, uh, so that so that more of the city will buy into this, he's gotta run 
a a, a like <clears throat> um a newspaper that is uh considered above board and that everybody pays attention to and he yes. also has now ma- so he owns <laughs> the tabloid and the mainstream paper that people pay attention to and people know he has both and they don't care yeah yeah Either that or some of them are maybe ignorant, too. I mean, who knows? I just feel like there was a panel someplace where somebody mentions that he has both, and they still were buying into everything he says, and I think oh, that's really funny. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just think that's so funny. <laughs> uh, and then uh, and, th- and then Peter says, Oh, hey! I didn't have to go find the, find the Sandman tonight. He was nice enough to attack my school. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm free this evening. Hey, Liz. And uh, she's like, I, I like her line here. Perhaps we, we should declare this a national holiday. <laughs> and uh, she's like, no, nah, I got plans now, you jerk face. And, and, uh, and, and so he's, he's, uh, he's once again not having a great day as Peter Parker or Spider-Man. Yeah, I like I like Liz Allen here because it's kind of easy to see things from her perspective, not knowing any of this. Yeah, like, that's true. Like if 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 I were in her position and someone had asked me out and I agreed, and then they said they had plans because something presumably something better came along, and then said, "Oh, hey, actually, I can." Like I'd be like, "I am." I made myself available the first time. Like I'm not gonna, you know. Uh, be your your uh your fallback plan or whatever like from her perspective uh you know it's totally sympathetic but it, it's just it's it's unfortunate for peter at the same time so yeah i mean uh, it's understandable she's obviously not supposed to be a fully sympathetic character in the first place but it, it, because you know she's she's seeing him as like a sympathy case and so he's <laughs> he's just it, it, he's just like the 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 low man on the totem pole who's uh, like really insecure and kind of desperate, and so uh, she sort of maybe half feels sorry for him, and that's why she she was thinking about going out with him in the first place. She says it's just because he won't leave her alone, and so like like uh, like you can totally see why she feels the way she does and why she does what she does. But she's also stuck up and has very much yeah, that, oh yeah that I'm I'm better than everyone. You know I'm, I'm the I'm the most popular girl girl in the school, and uh, this this loser guy. If I go out with that guy, all the other losers are gonna line up. <laughs> That's why you got to go out with a real man, Flash Thompson. Right, yeah. That's what real men look like, man. <laughs> and then uh, everybody hates Spider-Man. Uh, should I keep being Spider-Man? No, I don't want to. No, I have to. Responsibility, all that all that jazz at the end. Yeah, Spider-Man's already thinking about giving up. Again, issue four. He's, al- he's, he's already got his uh, uniform draped over something, thinking about not being Spider-Man anymore. Yep. The perspective makes that mask look huge. Yeah, I love that uh, that little drape of the mask there with the spider hanging over it. It's so cool. Uh, so, so that's the issue. Uh, we kind of went over everything. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, Dan? Uh, not particularly. I think as we went along, we did talk about most of the thematic stuff that, that you know that's there. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. not a uh, you know dense life-changing story and it's kind of <laughs> on the nose. But um, I, I think thematically, it, it, it does some stuff that's you know pretty good for the character and uh um we did do some uh pr- progression of him uh, for sure the next one is going to be fun though because uh spider-man fights dr doom in issue five and it's pretty awesome that's crazy they had him go up against doom that early i know because dr doom is like a international level threat with diplomatic immunity yeah he's and... a big deal you're 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 in trouble i mean like he barely made it out alive with uh dr octopus yeah, I, I, I haven't read that issue in a while. I can't wait to go back and read it. It's going to be awesome. Well, folks, we will try to get that up for you next week. In the meantime, thanks so much for listening and uh, looking at the panels. We'll see you again next time. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Bye! <laughs>